Hey guys, welcome to Introduction to Government, where we're going to look at exactly what it means uh, to have a government. So what we're going to look at today are the basics of what a government is. And there's two basic definitions that we need for government. And you need to get both of these written down in your notes. The first is government broadly construed, or rather government broadly understood, which is just the regulating of all human activity. What that means is there's a bunch of levels of government. Government means someone's in charge. You have governments that you live under. Uh, your parents are your government at home. When you come to school, there's a governing body here with the principals and the superintendent. There's a governing body in your city with city councils. There's state and there's national governing bodies. So government broadly construed is just the regulating of all human activity. But this class is much more about formal government. Formal government deals specifically with the nation state kind of system. It's a system of centralized organization that maintains system of control over communities large and small. So basically what that means is that there's a, a central group of people or a central organization, whether that be a king, a president, or a political party, that controls a group of people, okay? So that's what we're looking at when we talk about government in this, in this class. So why do we need government? Some people would say we don't. Those people, we call those people anarchists. Those are people that believe in the complete absence of government, that people could uh, feasibly govern themselves. People could be expected to uh, behave in a manner that is respectful to others. That hasn't been the, the human experience. We need government first off because it's necessary to develop public policy. Okay, what is public policy? Public policy is anything the government does to try and benefit the people. It covers everything from taxation, uh, the military, education, health care, the environment. Uh, any of these things are public policy. And you can't establish a good public policy without government. Thomas Hobbes, one of the greatest philosophers of all time, a uh, philosoph is a, a political philosopher. It's, a, it's a, a, a French term. It comes out of the Enlightenment. Thomas Hobbes called government the war of every man against every man. I love that quote. What, what Hobbes means by that is that without government, man would always be in fear for his own life. And government kind of pits us against each other in order to control those uh, baser instincts in men. There's a quote here, without government, Hobbes argues that man would always be in fear of his or her life and life would be, quote, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So his suggestion is that government is absolutely necessary. Government has three fundamental powers they have to have, okay? We usually call this separation of power. And in the US government, we have three branches that do it. But all branches have this in some form or other, even if it's held by one person. But there's executive powers, legislative powers, and judicial powers. Executive powers are simply the power to execute or enforce the law. In our nation, it's the President of the United States that holds executive power and the executive branch, President, Vice President, uh, cabinet members. But the President is the chief executive. Legislative power 
think of legislative L, legal. Legislative powers are the lawmaking body. In our nation, that's Congress. In uh, England, it's Parliament. In the Soviet Union, it was the Dumas. Uh, and if, if in a monarchy, it's just the king makes the laws. But there's always somebody or something that makes the laws. And finally, the judicial. The judicial power is the power to interpret the laws. It's the court system. Think judicial judge, judicial judge. So executive, president, executes the law. Legislative, Congress, makes the law. Judicial, judges, interpret the law. So while anytime you have government, you necessarily have politics. And none of us like politics. Uh, politics is a, a, a difficult concept. There's an old joke that, 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 that politics comes from the Latin word poly, meaning many, like a polygon, and ticks, meaning blood-sucking creatures. Uh, that's not really what it means. Aristotle said that man by nature is a political animal. And what he meant by that is man will always organize himself and his people in order to uh, benefit himself. Politics is, politics is simply a process where society determines how power and resources will be distributed and who will reap the benefits of those resources. You have to have some system in place where uh, it's determined who gets what's produced. And all nations do it different ways. Uh, some establish an economic system like communism where the state owns everything and then it's redistributed out equally. Others develop an economic system like capitalism where private ownership of property means whoever owns the property reaps the benefits. And most systems are somewhere in between, some kind of a mixed system. And while those are economic systems, they're also political systems. They're part of politics. We're gonna go through a few terms that we need to make sure we can use properly. In any government class because sometimes the way we use a term in government is not the same way we use the term in our everyday language. First off, let's think about what a state is because in our everyday parlance, our everyday language, we believe that a state is Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas. It's a, a political organization that is part of a larger national group. But that's not what we mean by state in government. A state is a body of people that live in a defined territory. That means they have boundaries. They're organized politically with the power to make or enforce a law without the consent of any higher power. So by that definition, we have what we call nation states. Uh, Greece is a state. England is a state. Technically, the United States is a state. It's, it meets that definition. It's a body of people living in a defined territory. They're organized politically. They can enforce a law, and they don't need the consent of any higher power to do so. Um, so state is kind of a term that in the, in the United States we think of differently. Um, we also use another term called nation. And nation and country are used kind of um, interdependently together, okay? But they really shouldn't be. A nation is actually, by definition, refers to the race or a large group of people living in one area. It's an ethnic term. So when you talk about a nation, what you're really talking about is all the people 
that share that same ethnicity and that same, that same culture. That's why you'll sometimes hear things like the Indian nation or the Palestinian nation, the, uh, uh, the Jewish nation. And they're not really referring to a country, they're referring to all of those people. Sometimes a nation and a country can be the same thing. You can have a nation state where it's both a political state with defined boundaries and uh, a nationality of people. I think of China in this way in a lot of ways. Um, I can think of like the Philippines as a nation state. Country, however, is a geographic term. Country refers to a particular place, a region, or a, an area of land, again, with defined boundaries. But a country does not have to have people of the same uh, uh, cultural or ethnic background. The United States is really more of a country than a nation, okay? The United States, while we think of ourselves as a nation of something, something unique, in reality, we're a melting pot. We're all nationalities come to the United States and we formed a country. So those words really shouldn't be used interchangeably. They're a little bit different. The last term I wanna talk about when we're talking about a state is sovereignty. Sovereign is an old term for a king. Your king used to be called the sovereign. In fact, they, they, they still are sometimes. Sovereignty means having supreme and absolute power in an area. And when we talk about sovereignty, sometimes we talk about state sovereignty, where there can be certain issues that the state has all the power in and the national government has no say. And sometimes we talk about national sovereignty, where there's issues that the national government has all the power and the state has none. So we're gonna use that word sovereignty quite a bit in this class, and you need to be able to use it properly. So how did these states develop? How did states arise? There's a few different theories out there. And again, they're all theories. Um, people will argue which one of these cor is correct. I would argue that probably they're all correct in different ways. Uh, different states have emerged through different theories. The first theory, and this is the oldest theory, is called the force theory. And it's just what it sounds like states develop by force. It's where an individual or a group claim control of an area, its people, its resources, through violence or intimidation. This is when one state uh, goes to war and defeats another state, or a king overthrows a king and, and, and takes power. Uh, the force theory is probably the easiest theory to prove of all of them. The second theory is called the divine right theory. There's not many states that have this anymore. But this is, a, again, a very old system. And throughout most of our history, large parts of the world were ruled under divine right. Divine means godlike, God, king. Uh, so divine right means uh, ruling under the authority of the king. It's just the belief that a, an area's sovereign, an area's king, are chosen by God to rule that area, and that rules a birthright. And since it's a birthright, it's handed down through heredity. What that means is you're a king because your dad was a king and his dad before him was a king. And it goes all the way back to some time when God chose your ancestor to be king of that area. It is your divine right to be uh, the leader of an area. The third theory is called the evolutionary theory. Supporters of this theory believe that all governments are is uh, uh, a, a system that evolved out of the family system. And we one time had a, had a small family system where families were led by a patriarch, a father. And then the families, as they got larger, they became clans. Uh, where groups of families would unite and whoever the eldest male was would, would run the clan. 
and then the clans would unite and they would form tribes. And the tribes would then uh, go to war or unite and form states. And over time, we developed these states through the evolutionary theory. Uh, great examples of this would be places like, uh, like Israel. If you look at the Old Testament, it's very much an evolutionary theory how family groups became clans and tribes and eventually the state of Israel. The fourth theory is the social contract theory. In the United States, this is the most popular. Uh, this is how our government was founded. Uh, if you ever, ever read the Declaration of Independence, it talks about this. It talks about governments being instituted among men. What that means is men came together and they made a deal to create this government. They made a social contract. This is the idea that sovereign states are granted power over a region by the people, and the people are ultimately the sovereigns. All power ultimately rests in the people. We, the people, gave the government this power. So you're trading certain personal rights for the well-being well of the group. Some of the more famous social contract philosophers uh, are Thomas Hobbes, uh, Rousseau, Harrington, but the most important of these is John Locke. John Locke was a Scottish philosopher, and he's the only one that I'm going to test you over uh, because he had the largest influence on the United States government. John Locke once wrote that man has certain fundamental rights, and those rights are life, liberty, and property. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, it's because when Thomas Jefferson wrote his Declaration of Independence, and we'll look into that in great detail later on, he, we'll call it, borrowed the ideas of John Locke, and he did some paraphrasing. Uh, he took life, liberty, and property, and he changed it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The fundamental government, the fundamental uh, uh, document that founded our nation was largely borrowed from the Scottish philosopher John Locke. The United States is based on a social contract. <laughs> 